What's up guys, Dull Matter here, and today we're gonna to be reacting to another History of China video. So this one is the Nurhachi, Nurhaki? I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Nurhaki, Nurhasi? Uh, the Rise of the Jurchen. Um, so, yeah, anyway, uh, I'm sure he'll pronounce it in this video and then we'll know how to pronounce it properly. I have that problem with a lot of these videos. Uh, I, I do enjoy learning about the history of like other parts of the world because I, I find that like, you know, my history is very limited to European history. Um, some Middle Eastern history, usually in relation to Christianity and stuff like that, but definitely the places I need to learn the, mo the most about are pre-colonial Indian history and Southeast Asian history. I think those are the areas that I have the least knowledge of, um, but this I don't know about either, so it's interesting. But anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. The ambition of a single man has often changed the course of history. In four decades of work, I am a big proponent of great man history. A lot of people don't like it, um, especially nowadays, but I think it's so underrated, um, nowadays at least. It used to be kind of the dominant theory, uh, and I think in, in many ways we should return to that because I think, you know, the, you know, just look at like the, is it Pareto distribution? Um, you know, the vast majority of people don't produce nearly as much as you know, a few hyper producers. And I think that, you know, that carries over to, uh, you know, history as well. Look, a northern tribes ban would successfully unify scattered tribes, break free from a whole empire's dominance, and lay the path to conquer all of Eastern Asia. So is the story of Nurhachi. Kind of just an aside, but I think the, the rise of the hatred of great man history I don't think it's a coincidence that it also coincides with the rise of what's often termed blank slate theory, um, which has been widely disproven, and yet still people hate great man history. But anyway, Nurhachi, I think is what he pronounced. In the 16th century, the great Ming dynasty that had once shined as one of the world's most powerful empires started to decline. Eunuchs in the court centralized power in their hands as Portuguese and Spanish missionaries spread the word of Christ to the Chinese people. The nation's northeast neighbors were several semi-sedentary tribes known as the Jichchen Confederation, who in name were vassals of the Ming. There was, however, little unity in the confederation. The three main groups were each divided in many tribes that often battled each other. The wild In Jichchen's. this tumultuous society, on the 8th of September 1559, Nurhaci was born. He belonged to the southernmost major Jurchen group, the Jianzhou, led by Wang Gao. That chieftain despised his Chinese suzerains and regularly attacked Ming villages. These acts of violence escalated until Wang Gao killed a Ming commander in 1573. In response, the Chinese sent a punitive expedition, led by the veteran Li Changliang, a seasoned general of Korean descent. The Chinese general used his authority to gather other tribes against the chieftain Wang Gao, and his general Jurchen. In two years, with the help of a rival tribe, Wang Gao was captured and executed. His death would however only bring more turmoil within the Jurchen, as the power general vacuum. Jurchen group was now leaderless. Three main contenders tried to take power. Wang Gao's son A Tai, Ni Kan Wai Lan, and Nur Hachi's grandfather, Jie Changa. In order to increase their influence within the general, Jiu Changga and his son Taxi, who were free from Wang Gao's authority, allied themselves to the Chinese general Li Changliang, as did Ni Kan Wailan. Their service would soon be requested, as Wang Gao's son A Tai launched raids against Ming territory in 1582. Consequently, a new Chinese punitive expedition led by Li Changliang was dispatched, in which Nu Hachi's father and grandfather took part. In 1583, A Tai was killed. But Nurhachi's ascendants, however, also died in battle in unclear circumstances. It was strongly suspected that Nikan Wailan had arranged their deaths to secure his influence. The young Nurhachi was now an orphan. It was said that all he inherited from his late family members was a set of 13 suits of armor. Perhaps feeling responsible for him, or in a strategic move, Li Changliang decided to foster him. That actually kind of talks about how wealthy they are, because I don't think. Armor was pretty expensive back then. I guess it depends on like what kind of armor you talk about, but like the fact that they had thirteen sets of armor, that's uh that's like the you know, I, I received a small loan of a million dollars from my father. That's like the the what is the sixteenth century China equivalent of that. 
and gave him permission to succeed as the new Jendro chieftain. Under his wing, the new leader would learn Chinese languages. He studied Chinese strategy and read classics, such as Romance of the Three Kingdoms and Water Margins, that allowed him to grasp the essence of political and military- Okay, so I've heard Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the Water Margins I've never heard of before that. I might have to look into that one, maybe I can get a copy of it. I should read the Romance of the Three Kingdoms too, I'm familiar with it, but I've never read it. Three tactics. These skills would later prove most useful for the young ambition chieftain, who began unifying small local tribes under his banner. Swearing to avenge his family, Nurhaci, at the age of 25, campaigned against rival neighboring tribes in 1584 and then again in 1587. Ni Kan Wailan, the man who had supposedly killed his father and grandfather, was captured by Li Changliang while attempting to escape. The Chinese commander delivered him to Nurhaci, who immediately had him executed, fulfilling his revenge. In the following months, using both military strategy and political marriages, his territory and influence grew. In 1589, the young leader captured a bandit lair, rescuing many Chinese captives. He then delivered them to Ming authorities, who thanked him by bestowing a minor rank on him. By now, he had several thousands of retainers loyal to him. The young chieftain could now focus on unifying all of the Jiuxian tribes. In 1591, his brother-in-law, who was also a chieftain, demanded lands be ceded to him. Unsurprisingly, Nurhaci refused, but in response his brother-in-law raised a coalition of tribes against him. By October 1593, over 30,000 soldiers from nine different tribes, led by his brother-in-law, attacked his territory. Rapidly, Nurhaci deployed his Jendro Jirchen, and using the Chinese strategy he had studied, he was able to defeat the much larger enemy coalition, killing several thousands and capturing over 3,000 war horses. This was a turning point for the Jendro Jirchen, who had now become the most powerful of all the Jirchen tribes. Meanwhile, great events were taking place on the Korean Peninsula. Beyond the sea to the east, after decades of civil war, the Japanese united and launched an expedition to conquer Korea in 1592. And it didn't go very well, did Being it? a vassal of China, Korea requested help from the Ming Dynasty that sent reinforcements. Nurhaci also offered his help to fight in Korea against the Japanese, which strengthened China's good opinion of him. But Korea, however, refused his assistance. Therefore, while the Japanese were being repelled from Korea, the young Jendro chieftain continued to strengthen his tribe by war and marriage. As a result for his offer to help in Korea, and for having maintained unity within the Jendro group, the Chinese authorities bestowed Nurhaci in 1595 with the title of General of the Dragon Tiger, that no Jichin before him had ever obtained. His power was only growing, as a chieftain, he understood the economy and created a monopole on trade of furs, pearls and ginseng. He also realized that much like the advanced Koreans, the respected Mongols... Uh, monopole, I'm... I'm not, I, I've heard, I know what monopoly is, I've never heard the term monopole though, I'm assuming they're related terms. No, monopole... Uh, okay, apparently it literally means the exact same thing as monopoly. Okay, apparently it means the exact same thing as Monopoly. Okay, so created Monopoly. And of course, the mighty Chinese. A strong state could not be established without a written script. He ordered in 1599 two of his translators to create a transcription of the Jirchen language, adapted from the nearby Mongol script. Now, with sufficient authority and wealth, Nurhaci pursued his campaigns to unify the Jirchen tribes. Of the two other major groups, the High Sea Jirchen were the closest to him. Starting in 1599, he began fighting the Hulun alliance of four tribes, essentially composing the High Sea Jirchen. The ever-increasing number of soldiers within his army, however, led to a new problem. Up to then, the Jirchen would fight in hunting parties of 10 to 12 men each, but with thousands of soldiers, such a force could not be controlled effectively. Between 1600 and 1601, the leader had to reorganize his warriors. Nurhaci split the whole army into four divisions, each following a colored banner, yellow, blue, red, or white. Are those the, the actual- further divided into companies of- Are those the actual banners? Those look sick. That'd be a pain in the ass to draw, though. 
It's like if you man, you know how you have to like draw the flag when you're a kid. If you're in like Bhutan, I think it's Bhutan where they have the dragon flag. It would be such a pain in the ass. Several hundred men. Under this new organization, war on a larger scale could now be conducted. As Nurhachi's power was strengthening, his foreign relations changed. His respect towards his Chinese suzerains diminished. The neighboring Mongol tribes recognized him as a Khan, and the Koreans grew intimidating, ensuring peace on both his eastern and western borders. At the beginning of the 17th century, the Jentro leader began to integrate the two other main Jurchen groups, the Raisi Jurchens and the World Jurchens. The latter was subdued in 1611, and the four main Haisi tribes of the Hulun Alliance did not fare any better. The Hada fell in 1601, the Hoifa in 1607, and the Ula around 1613. Only the Yeha tribe now remained to integrate, and all of the Jichchen people would be unified on the Nurhachi. That tribe, however, had... He's gonna be pretty old at this point, right? Like, I guess, I guess he did take power, essentially, as a child, so he might not even be that old yet, but... We started in the 1500s, and now we're already to 1613, so I guess maybe he's in, like, his 30s or 40s now. Strong ties with the Ming Empire, he grew concerned of Nurhachi's power. When he tried to subdue the Yeha, the Ming sent reinforcements, which allowed them to resist the attack. Frustrated, the chieftain had to withdraw. Reforms were needed. To better manage his increasing banner army, Nurhachi split the four divisions into two, creating eight groups each one under a unique colored banner. The Jianzhou Jirchen were no longer hunters and tribal warriors. This was the Eight Banner Army that would exist for centuries. The leader signed a treaty with the Chinese defining official borders, therefore imposing authority on his domain. He also decreed laws and appointed magistrates, built fortresses and strongholds. The Jianzhou Jirchen, under his leadership, were flourishing. Time had come to officialize his state. On the 17th of February 1916, Nurhachi declared himself a Khan and founded his own state, the Leite Jin. This was a turning point for history. As he was now officially a monarch of an independent state, he would no longer send tributes to China as a vassal. To consolidate administration and stabilize his state, he began to develop a bureaucracy. With thousands of soldiers and a solid war-able state, it was time to assemble the Eight Banners and go to war. Rebellion. After years of careful planning, Nurhachi made his move. The Ming had to be fought. I'm guessing this is a rebellion against the Ming. It's kind of like a gray area though, right? Can you even consider that a rebellion? I guess the Ming, well, I mean, at this point, I think the Ming still saw, had used kind of, well, I mean, you still kind of see this today. They kind of like, uh, oh, excuse me, the Middle Kingdom philosophy, right? Which is that China is China's basically the center of the world, and therefore... Everyone needs to pay them tribute. I'm guessing that's kind of the thing, is that like they don't view themselves as part of China, but China views them as part of China. On the 7th of May, 1618, he announced a manifesto of seven grievances against the Ming, both justifying war and declaring it on the Chinese Empire. War on a scale that Jichchen had never seen before would be fought. The Khan launched his first attack on the Chinese at Fushun, an isolated fortress. From his experience with the Chinese, he knew that only a light garrison was stationed there, and soldiers in the region were underpaid and underfed. With 20,000 soldiers, Murhachi attacked the fortress. Pay and feed your troops. After a few days of fighting, the local commander, Li Yongfang, decided to surrender. He and his men even defected to the Jin Khanate. They would be the first of many. The conquests of the Ming had started. Yep. In the following months... That's exactly why. You don't pay your soldiers, you don't feed your soldiers. They're hungry, they're starving, they're poor. Why not side with the other guys? What's the worst that could happen? Several other cities in southern Manchuria were captured, but the Yeha Jirchid tribe was still not under his control. In 1619, Nurhachi launched his forces against the Yeha, knowing this would also provoke their Ming allies. Without fail, the Chinese Ming dispatched troops and also called on their Korean vassals. Consequently, the Jin capital city got besieged from all sides. Against Nurhachi's army, counting about 60,000 troops, mainly cavalry, stood Chinese cannons, Korean hand cannons and matchlocks, and rival Jirchen cavalry from the Yeha tribe. The combined enemy army counted well over 100,000 troops. This was the Battle of Sarhu. 
Nurhachi knew that standing his ground was not an option, as the cannons would tread his forces. He therefore decided to send his cavalry to charge in every direction. This proved to be a wise move, as the assailants were unable to stand the brute force of thousands of war horses. That's an interesting. Each enemy company fell one by one. I guess the thing you have to remember too at that point is like the, the amount of time it takes to reload these guns. And a lot of people, when they think of like, um, you know, matchlocks and muskets from like the 15, 1600s, they, a lot of the time what they're actually thinking of is muskets from like the 17 and 1800s. But a lot of the muskets at that point were so big that they literally had like tripods that you would fucking set it on and then you would shoot and then it would take like, you know, however long to reload the thing like... You know, if you're good at it, like, you might be able to do, a, like, a shot in, like, a minute. I, I think, uh, oh, there was a channel, I can't remember what it was, but even the muskets of, like, the 1700s, like, really good shots, I think were, like, three shots a minute, right? So you're talking about probably a much longer time back then and a much heavier gun and a much less accurate gun. Um, so while they are good for that initial volley, you know, once the first wave gets past that volley, right, or once the first wave is, you know, you do deal with that first wave with the first volley, then shit hits the fan. Either retreating or surrendering. The Khan returned triumphantly into his capital city, celebrating his brilliant victory against the coalition. He wrote a letter to the King of Korea, intimidating him further and asking why he had contributed to the attack. The response was a humble letter congratulating the Khan for his brilliant victory. Nurhachi knew that Korea would no longer dare attack the Jin. We have now unbreakable morale, the Jin forces continued their attacks. In late September 1619, at an ultimate battle, the Yeha tribe was finally subdued. The Jichin were now all united on the Nurhachi's Jin Khanate. The leader, ambitious as ever, would now attempt to conquer all of China. In early 1621, he conducted the conquest of all of Liaodong Peninsula, capturing Shenyang and Liaoyang from the Ming. Everywhere the Khan led his forces, Han ethnic Chinese soldiers and commanders died, fled, or surrendered and were integrated. The capital city was moved to Shenyang to centralize power. The city got its Manchu name that is more famous in the west, Mukden. There, the imperial palace was built, known today as the Mukden Palace. All of Manchuria was now firmly in control of the Jin Khanate. At the age of 66, Nurhachi prepared to launch yet another campaign. Okay, so he is getting old. I was wondering how old he was at this point. Um, I hadn't been paying close enough attention to the dates, and I'm like... But I noticed they're going up and up and up, and it's like, okay, he conquered these guys like a year later, and these guys seven years later, and these guys eight years later. It's like, he's got to be getting up there. Pain against the Ming at the coastal city of Ningyuan. On the Chinese side, morale was wavering. The local Ming commander ordered all remaining Chinese forces to withdraw behind the Great Wall, consequently abandoning Ningyuan. But Yuan Chonghuan, the local commander at Ningyuan, however opposed this decision. Chad picture. He was consequently left behind with 20,000 soldiers, alone against all of the Jichun hordes. Upon learning that most of the Chinese forces had retreated, Nurhachi led his men. Over 100,000 Jichun soldiers and horses trampled the ground south, along the Yellow Sea coast. Nurhachi, following his integration tactics, tried to intimidate Yuan Chonghuan into surrendering, claiming to lead twice the amount of men he really had. But Yuan Chonghuan's loyalty and sense of honor were incorruptible. He responded by saying he and his men would fight to death, adding an old saying, those who seek life will die, but those who welcome death will prevail. The Chinese commander ordered to burn everything outside of Ningyuan in a scorched earth tactic. He deployed Portuguese cannons along the walls of the city and patrolled them, checking for any defect. Finally, the day before the battle, Yuan Chonghuan made a blood pact with his soldiers. If Ningyuan fell, the Jichun would flood China. The Jin army finally reached the city and the soldiers started to set up camp. They were however too close and the Portuguese cannons started bombarding their position, inflicting many casualties before the Jin hastily retreated. Later, Nurhachi personally led the attack on Ningyuan. Again, the cannons incessantly detonated on the Jin cavalry. It had to attack from another angle. Suffering huge casualties, the Jin finally arrived at the base of the walls, but the defenders lit trails of saltpeter, creating a barrier of fire around the city. 
Burning oil and poisoned bombs were launched from atop the walls. The siege was failing. For the first time in his military career, Nurhaci was losing. On the 10th of February, the unthinkable happened. Amidst yet another attack, the Jin leader was wounded by a cannon shot. Consequently, he called off the campaign and retreated to his capital. Apart from a few minor battles, Nurhaci's conquests were ending. In July, the leader fell ill. As weeks followed, it appeared he was unable to recover from the disease. And finally, while on a journey back to his capital city, at the age of 67, the great Jirchen leader died on the 30th of September, 1626. Although having many children, he did not designate an heir to inherit the leadership of the Jirchen people. Let me guess. Civil war. Uh, almost always happens. Daishan, his second son and a brilliant general, using his influence, assembled all the Jirchen princes. They agreed to designate Abahai, Nurhaci's okay. eighth son, as his successor. Man, props to them. This dude, like, actually raised his sons properly, apparently. But that's, like, one of the things you always see with, like, so many of these dynasties is if there's if there's no heir declared or there's no system, like a primogeniture system in place, and even sometimes when there is a system or an heir declared, instantly they start fighting and fucking killing each other, and the next thing you know, like, all this shit you built just falls into civil war. Better known by his Chinese name, Huang Taiji. In the course of one lifetime... Nurhaci cunningly unified all of the Jirchen tribes, developed a writing system for his language, broke free from Chinese dominance, founded a strong state, and laid for his descendants the path to conquer all of China. His son would rename the Jirchen as the Manchus, finally defeat the once great Ming dynasty, claim the mandate of heaven, and establish the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty to rule. So I w one thing I want to check, the, the Manchus, what... Uh... So that's obviously, you know, the Manchu, I guess, Wikipedia. Uh, Manchu people. They, what, oh, let's see. Languages, Manchu. Oh, it's a Tunguskic language. Okay. So, yeah, they are interesting. So it's not even a... Um, it's considered critically endangered. I was wondering if it was a, a, a cynic language or not. Over China. Thank you for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions or requests, don't hesitate to leave them in the comment section below. This is a really good video, but yeah, I was wondering at the end there because, like, the, you know, obviously the Manchus go on to rule China. I believe until it collapses uh, into the civil war with like the con well, I guess they have the short-lived republic, and then they have the civil war between the communists and the nationalists. Um, but I was wondering, you know, native twenty native speakers, thousands of second language speakers. Wow, twenty native speakers—that's crazy. Uh, but I was wondering if it was a Cynic language or not. Um, but yeah, what, what are the? So it is a Tunguskic language, which is basically those are just languages that are specifically in like. Eastern Russia, it looks like there's a little bit, yeah, in China, uh, Northern China, and there's actually a little bit in uh, Northwest China, too. What's the one in Northwest China? Uh, is it Zigbee? I believe it's Zigbee. Yeah. Um, a separate language within the Southern Tunisia group, uh, Okay, so it's, it's actually related to... Cyber troops were dispatched to this... Oh, so... Wow, this language actually only split off about 200 years ago. Interesting. Man, uh, linguistics is such an interesting thing. Um, but yeah, the Cynic languages. I think the only ones are Tibetan and then the Chinese languages, right? So a, a Cynitic, I guess is what it's called, not Cynic. Um, but yeah, you've got... Uh, or I guess it's the Sino-Tibetan family. Oh, there's actually way more than I thought. Okay, Burm I didn't realize Burmese was a... Uh, interesting. Yeah. Anyway, let me know what you guys think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.